world. So we're excited to have you, Tim. Thanks so much for taking the time and joining us today. I'm going to kick it over to you um, and uh, let you uh, give everybody some expertise on their Tower Garden experience that they may be having, particularly growing here in, uh, in Canada. So thanks. Stevens, thank you so much for that great introduction. And, and uh, I'm so excited to uh, be here today uh, speaking to um, all my friends throughout Canada and the United States. I had a chance to um, uh, go to a wonderful boot camp up in Banff um, this winter and uh, uh, had so much joy and fun listening to all the Canadian tower gardeners talk about their gardens and share their passion and share literally how they're transforming health um, uh, across Canada and changing the lives of people, you know, one person at a time, um, starting with a healthy diet and whole food nutrition and growing all this beautiful produce uh, right in the comfort of their own backyard. So today I'm going to be talking about, uh, I call it my Tower Garden 101, and it's really um, all the details, the, the, the secret tips from you know professional growers, things I learned over the years from um, back in my days at the hydroponic greenhouses at the Walt Disney World Company to working in real greenhouses or working right in my own backyard. What are the tips that help uh, me succeed on a daily basis? This is what I'm gonna be sharing with you today. All right, so here we are. Tower Garden 101, made simple. That's what it's all about. Um, everything I'm gonna be teaching today is really revolves around keeping it fun and simple. That's what gardening should be all about. Um, you know, if, if you think about the conventional gardening I grew up, it requires a ton of bending, weeding, tilling, um, getting dirty. Um, it just takes a lot of energy and in, and in a busy world, I prefer you know, the, the garden on the right, a vertical tower garden that uses only a 30 inch footprint. There is no bending, weeding, tilling. In fact, they're just sitting, relaxing, listening to the beautiful water sound. Sounds like a waterfall when you're next to a tower, read a book, enjoy life, and then harvest uh, when you need to. So again, Great difference there, all about keeping it fun and simple. And you know, wherever I travel around the United States and Canada, the people who I see succeeding with tower gardens and conventional gardens, they're keeping it fun and simple. I mean, look at this beautiful tower garden. They're, they're pulling it to an event. I mean, what garden could you bring to a farmer's market or an event? So the tower garden, like the iPhone, is really creating a revolution in local food and a revolution in gardening and we're able to educate people in ways that we never could have before and i don't know what was going on here but i took these pictures uh, and uh, included them in my presentation because people are keeping it fun and simple and they're growing beautiful beautiful healthy gardens um, look at that beautiful garden on the left i call that my cornucopia tower everything from chard to beautiful um uh, summer squash on the bottom there and that tower garden on the right, you got some beautiful uh, eggplant. Uh, so many, look at those. If you like hot peppers, um, again, I don't know if this is fun and simple, but it's hot and simple. <laughs> uh, if, if you like peppers, um, some beautiful salad towers, and of course, everybody's favorite strawberries. And again, schools, we are revolutionized. Rev there is a revolution happening in schools across North America, and the Tower Garden is part of that revolution for teaching science and getting healthy food back in the classroom for the first time in decades. So we are so excited about that. I want to start off today when we talk about keeping it fun and simple. I just want to talk about some basics. Um, where do I put my Tower Garden? You know, I've learned on this journey that anybody who's ever had a vegetable garden and learned from their parents or grandparents knows that you. You go out to your backyard and you find a sunny spot and then that's where you put your tower garden. But it seems like sometimes when people buy a hydroponic or aeroponic growing system like the tower garden, it's so beautiful and it's so pretty. They want to um, design it perfectly like a piece of furniture and they might stick it in the shade or stick it in the corner. So 
it's very important that um, we put this vertical garden somewhere where we're going to get lots of sunlight. You know, most of your vegetables, lettuces, and herbs, these are what we call in the world of horticulture a high light crop, okay? Especially your fruiting crops. So the more sun you get, the more fruit they produce. The less sun you get, the less fruit they produce. So all these towers you see here are out in a full sunlight or somewhere that gets the majority of sun throughout the day. So lots of sunlight, very important, especially on a vertical garden. We get a little bit of shading, so we definitely want to be in, in, a, in a good light area. Um, water is very important. You know, when we keep it fun and simple, we want to make sure the things that we need are going to be near our tower garden. So, um, you know, we don't want to be hauling five gallon buckets of water um, every week from a hose bib a mile away. We want to make sure we have a hose bib near our tower garden or a good quality hose from that hose bed where we can just always keep um, that tower garden full of water, right? Um, I wanna mention this filter because there are areas around the United States where uh, especially people who um, are getting their water from some of the Great Lakes and some of those areas, there's a lot of chlorine, chloramine, and mineral content. So this filter is called a CP Gator and it is specifically designed for backyard gardening, soil gardening, and hydroponics, and it removes a lot of the things that are a challenge to vegetable crops. So if you're growing in a tower garden, just not necessarily seeing the results you like, in some cases, not, not most, but in some cases, it could very well be your water supply, and these filters um, are a great thing to include on your garden. Power, um, this is number three, should be number one, but it's one of the most important things I can talk about here today. Um, we want to be sure that we have an outlet near our tower garden. And if we don't have an outlet, we want to be sure that we buy a heavy duty, not a thin, a thin extension cord, a nice thick extension cord, and one that is long enough to go from the outlet all the way to the tower. I can't tell you the number of times I've seen people put a tower garden 100 feet away from an outlet, and, um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing if they used one good quality thick extension cord, but they went down in their basement and got their Christmas supplies <laughs> and extension cords for their lamps. And they're even using uh, um, indoor extension cords outdoors and they're patching two, three, four extension cords together. And that most likely is going to cause your tower garden uh, to trip the GFI outlet and, and cause a little power outage at that outlet. Uh, thus damaging the tower. So um, forget about patching a bunch of cords together. Use just one good quality cord and you're going to find you have a lot better luck uh, growing in your tower that way. Number four, you want to keep your tower protected in situations where you have high wind or, and this goes for any garden, um, or animals, you know, like deer and things like that. So a lot of people We'll put a tower garden in, their, in a fenced backyard or an enclosed area. That way, when they get the high winds, it doesn't tear up the seedlings or the plants, especially if you're growing vining crops like cucumbers or tomatoes. You know, those heavy wind days, it can, even in a conventional garden, it can really tear the plants up. So having some protection like a backyard fence is very helpful. So keep that in mind. If you have animals, you know, you can use a wire fence. But if you have a high wind, you know, a solid fence, can be very helpful in those situations. Accessibility number five, this is so important. Let's take a look at what I mean by accessibility. This is kind of the top view of a home and a backyard and uh, where my mouse is there, hopefully you can see that is the kitchen. So I always love to put my tower garden somewhere in viewing distance of the kitchen. And in this particular case, it's right outside the patio door. It gets good sunlight there. You can see it in your kitchen. And if it's very accessible and visible, you're going to use it in your cooking and your diet. And you're going to use it regularly. If it's somewhere far away, it's a little bit more easy to forget about it. So if it can be accessible, it's a great thing. Here we have it right outside a back door or on a balcony in a high-rise condo in a downtown setting. And this is my house uh, right uh, in Orlando, Florida, and um, uh, uh, where I just uh, left a few weeks ago and it was hot, humid, sweaty. So I'm, I'm grateful to be out in this climate right now. But um, 
whenever we're eating in Florida, we just literally slide open our patio door, walk out there and harvest our produce. I mean, it's literally tower to table on five steps and it's super fresh because it's always harvested within about 15 minutes of eating it. So again, some of our beautiful towers out there in our backyard. Uh, so we talked about tower placement. Where should you put your tower? We went through those tips. Next, I'd like to talk about seedlings. In order to get beautiful plants, like you see in the picture right there, we have to start with beautiful, healthy seedlings. And so in the United States, we have a wide range of authorized seedling providers across um, the United States um, that have you know, over 100 varieties of seeds readily available. Um, in Canada, um, we have uh, over in uh, Gibbons, BC, we have Troy Edwards there. You can see his Facebook address. Um, he's a local provider. I know, um, I don't even know all the names across Canada, but I know we have small farms starting up as well as several radically awesome, successful tower gardeners that grow their own seedlings for um, many of their school projects and many of their customers. And uh, uh, I love, I love it when our clients are able to buy seedlings from a local vendor, and, and I'll tell you why. And there's always this question mark, should I start my seedlings or, or buy some if they're readily available? Um, so first, I'd, I'd like to differentiate um, what you would do when. Um, I'd like to talk about seed sources. So um, uh, uh, www.johnnyseeds.com is one of my favorite sources. Um, back in the early 90s when I started at Walt Disney World at the Land Hydroponic Greenhouses at Epcot, Johnny's was probably our source for more than half the seeds that we, or have half the beautiful plants that we grew at the land at Epcot. And so they have seeds that are heirloom. Um, they do disease testing. Their seeds are very clean. Um, and they also have varieties that professional growers use. They have hybrids. So a range of heirlooms all the way to modern hybrid, whatever you would like to grow, they're probably gonna have that seed. And certainly they're not the only seed provider in the United States and Canada, but they are an excellent one-stop shop. If you need one good starting point, Johnny Seeds is certainly, and again, they do a lot of virus and disease testing. So their seeds generally come in uh, very, very clean. So we don't, some of your smaller seed companies don't, um, aren't as good at the virus and disease testing. And sometimes you can get in seeds that you know, start off um, uh, very poor and then and, and damage your outdoor garden or your entire tower garden. So johnnyseeds.com, a great seed source. Um, you want to think about how much time you have, you know, especially if you have, if you're somebody who is helping a school or a new customer, um, you know, uh, instant gratification is what it's all about today. So if you're able to start a new tower garden off with some fresh, healthy seedlings, um, they get some instant gratification, and then you're literally harvesting produce within 10 to 14 days. So in my mind, that's very exciting. So it's much more successful for the new tower garden. Now, I get this question quite often. Um, the uh, tower garden net pod or the plant clip, um, which, you know, which way should I go, okay? So as a rule of thumb, I would say the, uh, the, plant, the net pod on the, the left we want to use for all of our large fruiting crops, and we always want to use that for our crops that we're cutting from regularly. So our lettuces and herbs, if we're going to keep those plants in our tower for you know two to six months and we're cutting off them regularly, that net pot is going to keep the plant very stable and locked into place. And also the black ring that you see around the net pot is going to keep the bugs and the algae out of your tower. The plant clip. Um, just slides in and out really quick. So that's really perfect for people who are doing the one-time harvest. You're harvesting living produce. We actually have home tower gardeners selling at local farmer's markets and events or bringing produce to some of the health and wellness events. So they wanna bring a full you know, living lettuce with the roots. They wanna show people what aeroponics is all about. So for your one-time harvest, that uh, plant clip is more ideal because it pops in and out of your tower very easily. So what's in the Tower Garden Mineral Blend plant food? So in order to tell that story, I'm gonna go back in time to the early 90s. I spent 12 years at Epcot from 1993 to 2005, 
in the earlier days at the land at Epcot, um, I was doing cutting edge research for um, institutions like the USDA, the Department of Energy, and NASA. NASA was one of my favorite. We actually um, worked with some of the earlier red and blue LED lights. They were very different back then, of course. And um, we also worked on some nutritional projects. And I remember sitting in a room full of scientists and, and uh, uh, with NASA and at the land at Epcot. And um, the question was asked, um, what can we do to get more nutrition into the plants? Because if we have um, uh, uh, astronauts that are living in the space station or they're on a lunar base or a Martian base and, and they don't have a, a, a health food store nearby and all they have to consume is what they're growing, we want this food to be the most nutritious possible. So back in those early years, I began to learn about the science behind hydroponic nutrition, what we can do to make it more nutritious, not just what we need to get a plant to grow healthy. In fact, I remember as a budding research scientist back then, I was like, well, this is really cool. This is a great idea, but why aren't we doing this for everybody? Why aren't we doing this for people here on Earth? <laughs> it just, it didn't really make sense to me why the focus was just astronauts and not those of us living on Earth. So um, when uh, it came to the Tower Garden, when we started developing the Tower Garden in 2005, six and seven, um, I had an opportunity to, to take those early days of science and take what I would learned uh, uh, more than a decade ago and begin to build a new nutrient solution that every household could use and get fresh uh, nutritional food um, from their tower garden. So um, it took us a few years to develop that. And now today the tower garden is clinically proven. Uh, the tower garden um, uh, mineral blend is actually the first hydroponic solution in the world or aeroponic solution to be a one size fits all. So we can grow everything from a head of lettuce to a beautiful beefsteak tomato. Um, and in addition to um, minerals and nutrients that the plant needs, we also included over 60 ionic trace uh, minerals that are very important to human health. So they're not necessarily required um, uh, for plant life, but if the plants can take them up, we want those trace minerals to be there. Now, these aren't minerals that we need a lot of or the plant needs a lot of. In fact, if you had too many, you'd harm the plants and you'd harm your own health. So these are um, 60 ionic trace minerals on very small amounts that get taken up into the plant. And not only um, do they help improve our nutrition um, when we eat that food, but um, it also improves the flavor and the phytonutrient content um, and the color of the plant. So those, those trace minerals can be very important. And um, the tower, it's exciting because the tower garden is clinically proven. We knew we had a good nutrient solution. Uh, we could tell by how the plant uh, looked and how it tasted and the beautiful aromas that would come from the plant. But several years ago, we had the University of, uh, the University of Mississippi uh, test our tower gardens. And, and for those of you that don't know, the University of Mississippi is home of the FDA's National Center for Natural Plant or excuse me, natural products research. So basically any food related item on a store shelf in the US, um, it's being tested at the University of Mississippi and approved. So we took our tower gardens and we literally um, set them out in the field, side by side um, with um, the same plants growing in the soil, literally the best possible growing conditions on earth, um, optimum tilth, optimum irrigation, weeding, optimum nutrition in the soil and um, at the end of the test, both the mineral content and the phytonutrient content, which is very important, uh, were tested um, in that produce. And the tower garden performed equal or better in every test across the board. So think about this vertical aeroponic tower garden, side by side compared with some of the best growing conditions on earth, and we were equal or better across the board. And we know that um, scientifically speaking, that most gardeners or definitely most farmers do not have the best soil conditions on earth. In fact, in most cases, those soils are very depleted. So it says a lot for uh, what we have going on behind the tower garden. And in addition to that, um, those plants use 98% less water and some of the varieties grew twice as fast. So there's some other environmental factors that go along here. And this is what it looks like. Those, the uh, minerals in the tower garden mineral blend are what we call water soluble. 
and they're stable in water. So they're literally floating around in that sump. And when the pump turns on, those minerals come up, that water cascades down past the roots, and the plant can then choose the amount of minerals and water it wants to take up as needed. So again, this is all about keeping it fun and simple. So I know that was some of the science behind what we have, but you know, uh, the beauty in it is just that one simple formula. We don't have to, you know, if you go to a conventional hydroponic store, they got a bottle for seedlings, they got a bottle for tomatoes, they got a bottle for cucumber, they got a bottle for lettuce, a bottle for herbs. You could walk out of a hydroponic store with an arm full of several hundred dollars in nutrients with conventional hydroponics. And the tower garden, those pictures you see there, whether you're growing the cornucopia tower on the right with eggplant, pepper, lettuce, and herbs to the lettuce towers on the left, it's really a one size fits all. And that helps it keep it fun and simple um, for our home gardening. So next I'd like to talk about the biggest challenges that I see. Uh, one of the key ones is overfeeding, okay? Um, with our Tower Garden Mineral Blend, it's perfectly balanced, guys. So more in this case is not better. And I know uh, US and Canadians, um, it's just kind of our, our style. You know, if the food needs something, we add more salt. If our coffee uh, doesn't taste sweet enough, we add more sweetener. But in this case, more is not better. In fact, it's highly detrimental. Uh, mineral buildup can occur in the tank, and it actually, during the day, can cause your plants to wilt. If we're overfeeding, um, we're gonna actually get poor growth in the tower garden. So let's say I made a mistake. I can't tell you the number of times over the years and Holly over there at Tower Garden, customer support in Memphis, Tennessee, she does a great job. And you know, um, so often we'll get these questions. I accidentally put pH buffer instead of my, um, my mineral solution. I accidentally did double. You know, if in doubt, I have a saying, throw it out. Just empty your sump start over, you're gonna have good luck. And I gotta tell you, um, I normally don't even have to do this. And oddly enough, uh, three weeks ago, I had some, some uh, I planted a new tower garden. I have, I have several and um, indoor and outdoor towers. And I saw an indoor tower where all my lettuce was getting tip burned, the edges were brown and it was closing in on itself. And, and I said, gosh, I did everything right. I cleaned my tower, rinsed my tower. You know, who knows? The kids could have come along and poured something in there. You know, maybe a, a friend came over and poured a soda in your tank. I mean, you don't know what happens when you're not there. Um, and, and it kind of baffled me. I could not figure out what it was. And so, you know, I drained my tank, I refilled it, and literally within five days, all the new lettuce leaves coming out look normal. So, again, if in doubt, dump it out. Um, if you make a mistake, don't. And again, you don't have to waste that nutrient solution. You can take it and Pour it out on some of your landscape plants. They're they're you know very valuable minerals that plants need, so they don't necessarily have to be wasted. But um, that's a great way to to uh, keep you on track. Now, um, even if you did make a mistake or you didn't overfeed, I always recommend um, uh, we have tower gardeners that actually grow up to a year in a tower garden before they ever take it apart and clean it. So um, if you do that, you really want to be changing your sump about every two to three months. And again. Um, you know, take that excess nutrient solution, use it on some of your outdoor landscape plants. They'll actually love it and appreciate it. So the best way to mix our Tower Garden Mineral Blend, um, since we're recording this, you can go back and uh, maybe look at the slide in a little bit more detail. But um, during the winter, we have it's one to 200, and we call this our full strength nutrient solution. This is all on the, the, the label of the Tower Garden Mineral Blend. In the summertime, we're gonna be half strength at one to 400, all right? so. The plants are drinking more, they're taking up more minerals, so we don't, we don't need that so strong. So if you're growing indoors, by the way, you're generally speaking, you're always gonna be using that winter formula, full strength. But if you have an outdoor tower garden during the summer, you're gonna be half strength. And then in the spring and fall, we're gonna be, um, uh, we're gonna dial that strength um, a little bit less, about one to 300 is what we're going to do for the spring and fall. It's so important to keep your sump full if you're, especially if you're growing outdoors, and I'll tell you why. This can provide some stable temperature for you. So a, a, the, your, your cool water, you know, as your nighttime drops in the summer, it's gonna help keep your plants cool in the summer and warmer in the winter. So the fuller your sump is, the more temperature buffer you're gonna have during those seasons, right? A heavy sump also gives you some nice wind protection. 
So for some of you out there, you've got these enormous tower gardens and they might rock in the wind. So when you keep, you know, 20 gallons of, of water in that sump, you have a 200 pound weight at the bottom of your tower and it's not going anywhere. And by the way, your pump works better. So it's an advantage to keep your pump, your sump full. So whenever I go out in the morning, I check in my tower, um, I just, I just fill my sump up. I like topping it off. Um, but there's no harm if you've got to be gone for a few days and you lose a few gallons of water. Just as a rule of thumb, if you can, I like to always keep my sump full. You get a little bit uh, better production out of that. <clears throat> Next, I'd like to talk about pH. <laughs> this is one of my favorite things to talk about. The instructions on the Tower Ground Mineral Blend tell you to keep your pH uh, around five to seven, and that's fairly accurate. Now, I think there's a lot of people out there that have in the past had a tropical fish aquarium, and they know that that pH, you know, is just dialed in just exact, and that if that pH gets out of that safe range, their fish actually die. And so I think sometimes for people who have had tropical fish aquariums and they've dealt with pH um, in that setting, um, uh, honestly believe that if they get below five or above seven, that it literally is the end of the world or they're closing in on the end of the world, right? And um, really not at all with our tower burn mineral blend. In fact, um, in some cases, um, this pH thing has created mad scientists where um, they see their pH get you know, to 7.3 and, and they run over there and they grab the pH down. And then they were in such a hurry, they, they lower the pH too much and, and down below five. And so they grab the pH up and they're back and forth and back and forth and they're stressed out and they're in a hurry. And um, uh, you know, um, before you know it, we've actually kind of, we've done too much up and down and we've, we've, we've messed up our, min our, our mineral chemistry in the tank and we don't wanna do that either. So what I'm going to share with you today is that um, just a minute ago, I was talking about how special our Tower Garden Mineral Blend is, how we can grow. Um, we use clean, pure ionic earth minerals. These are very safe. These are not petrochemicals that we see in other fertilizers out there. So while maybe some hydroponic fertilizers shouldn't be below five or above seven, um, that's a target range for us, but um, we can very much get uh, well below five and well above seven and have tremendous growth on my tower. Um, in fact, one of the special things with our tower garden mineral blend is that um, we, we pre-acidify that for you. So uh, we naturally acidify that. So when you blend that, uh, you know, most waters are alkaline. So when you take your A and you take your B and you blend them together, your pH is naturally going to start um, a little bit lower for you anyway. I can tell you whether I'm in Orlando or California, um, or any other part of the country uh, with well waters that are anywhere from 7.2 to 7.8. I've never adjusted pH on my tower garden ever because every time I add my A and my B, it lowers it. It doesn't mean you shouldn't ever look at it, but in my situation, I've never had to do it. So um, that's always very exciting for me. And um, I'll tell you, um, your plants will, horticulturally speaking, your plants will speak to you. Kale is a great indicator plant. Um, it's very unique in that um, when your uh, pH gets above seven, um, some nutrients become less available, not unavailable, they're less available. And iron is one of those few nutrients that is less available as you drift up above seven. Well, kale uses a lot of iron, so you'll actually see on the new growth, not on the old leaves, just on the new growth coming out, you'll see what they call intervenal chlorosis, where the veins are green, Okay, if you see that, and then in between the veins is a yellowing. And so for me, when I go outside and I see that in my tower garden, um, either I've been adding, you know, um, when I was on vacation, my neighbor was putting the hose in and, and just topping off my sump periodically. So my nutrients are either very diluted or my pH has gotten very high. And um, so that, so kale is a great indicator plant, but you know what's really interesting? chives and lettuces and all kinds of other plants in my tower garden will look perfectly normal and kale will be the first one to show up with an iron deficiency. You know that's not a bad thing, it's not a terrible thing, but it's an indicator that your pH may be um, too high. All right, let's move on here. So again, all about keeping it fun and simple. Wanted to share with you um, why I don't really overreact to pH, so while I like to 
watch my pH and and um, uh, you know, lots of people like to keep it within that range. They don't have to get real stressed out about it. We want to have look at those beautiful towers in that picture. Um, you know, I just follow the I follow all the instructions I just gave you. I don't do any bending, weeding, or tilling. Tilling, and our family comes out there every day, and we make beautiful juice uh, juices and smoothies from those towers every morning and actually throughout the day. So next I'd like to talk about my top three tips for what to grow in the tower garden. So if you're a first time gardener, it's so important to keep it simple. A lot of people get very excited and especially if they have someone who has seedlings near them, they want a tomato and an eggplant, a cucumber and a lettuce and an herb and a juicing and all this kind of stuff. And, and it just gets overcomplicated. So we wanna keep it simple. And I think it's very helpful. The, the second point is to have a tower garden with a purpose or a mission. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you're dieting or you're looking at a lower calorie diet and you're eating lots of salads, just do a salad tower. Um, if you're into juicing, like many of us in the health and wellness revolution are, our healthy living revolution, right? Um, uh, juicing towers are very valuable. So kale, chard, parsley, um, those are some of the uh, fastest growing um, juicing plants that you can grow in a tower garden. You will be cutting and cutting and cutting off of all those plants for at least a half a year and they never stop. For, and those of you on the other end of this webinar, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, herbs and cooking. So just pick some of your favorite cooking um, herbs and, and do a tower of those. So again, have a purpose and a mission. What am I gonna use my tower for? And keep it fun and simple. What I'm sharing with you, these are some of the simple crops. In fact, you know, another one of the reasons why I like the, the uh, fresh cut leafy greens um, such as lettuce, spinach, kale, chard, herbs. The, the United States Department of Agriculture says that um, from field to table, those leafy greens and lettuces and herbs lose up to 50% of their nutritional value. So not only are these plants starting off in depleted soils in many cases, they're losing up to 50% of their nutrition by the time they get to you. So um, a big benefit for growing some of these simple crops for your own personal health and nutrition. So while you're keeping it fun and simple, you're getting double the nutrition. So that's a good deal in my mind. All righty, next I'd like to talk about, um, uh, oh, excuse me, for number three, grow what you love and get results. So um, one of the th most important things that I've found is that if you don't love what you're growing, you're not gonna give it time and attention. So uh, get a tower garden with a purpose or mission, grow what you love and you'll get some tremendous results. Next, I'd like to talk about my top six horticultural tips. So when you're growing, what would those be? Following the pyramid planting method. What do I mean by that? Well, think of a tower garden as a vertical condominium. And I mentioned earlier at the beginning of this that um, we want uh, our gardens in a highlight setting, right? So we want our, we always want to make sure all of our plants get light. So we want our smaller plants on top our medium sized plants in the middle and then our large plants in the bottom. So you can see those, you know, what would go on the bottom, eggplant, squash, tomato, cucumber, anything large, things like green beans might go above that in the middle and then our smaller herbs and lettuces up top. Here you can see there's on the right hand side, there's a, a juicing tower of purple cabbage and then there's about 15 feet of watermelons crawling out from the bottom pot and the tower on the left, You've got some summer squash on the bottom all the way to your strawberries up on the top where they're getting all that beautiful highlight that they need. So follow the pyramid planting. Number two, group multiple towers efficiently. What do I mean by that? Well, if you there's many of you out there that have two, three, four, even six tower gardens in your backyard, you're killing it. You're literally growing almost every fruit, vegetable, herb, and lettuce that you need for your family and you're sharing with your school and your neighbors. And um, I love you, you, the diehard gardeners out there. You guys are amazing. Well, when you've got that many towers, um, in that particular case, you can group your towers. You can have a tomato tower and, a, and a, um, uh, other fruiting towers like the okra there on the right. And in this particular case, these towers, um, these larger plants, we might only have eight. That okra there, we have four plants at the bottom and four in the middle. And we're, you know, growing a six-foot okra plant for for goodness sakes there. And the larger tomato plants there, again, we only need about eight of them on a tower. Same with the cantaloupe, same with the tomatillo. Um, this is a juicing tower where we got chard and kale, um, 
and, and this is a juicing tower in our backyard. We have chard, parsley, kale. We're out there cutting off of it every day. So because we're, you know, I can send my kids straight out to my juicing tower and say, you know, uh, fill the bowl up and bring it back in. I don't have to go and try to uh, pick through a cornucopia of plants. So if you, if you have multiple towers, this is a great way to grow, to grow your plants. There's some beautiful lettuce towers and strawberry towers. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit later why, if you're really passionate about strawberries, why strawberries are a great one to grow um, in, in its own tower. So group multiple towers efficiently. Um, harvest efficiently. Um, I use the top cut method. So when you're doing a lot of juicing and a lot of salads, there are some quick ways to harvest. Um, and we call the top cut method. Um, uh, most of your plants grow from the center. So when you cut right above the growing tip, it's a quick uh, way to grab and cut. And I've got a quick video. We do, um, I do a segment called 60 Seconds of a Tower Tim. Um, you can see it on my uh, 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 Tower Garden Tim Blank Facebook and also more importantly, the Tower Garden uh, Facebook at towergarden.com or Tower Garden Canada. And good morning, everybody. I'll walk this you through this video here on this morning. We are how we do juicing top cutting. And I'm going to show you how simply you can cut off kale 5, 10, 15, 20 times before you have to replace these plants from your tower almost every single week. Let's take a look here. This kale has about six to eight seedlings inside, and you'll notice that right in the center of each seedling is a young grown tip. We don't want to cut those back. We want to cut right above each growing tip. So I'm going to grab this cluster, about like that. Cut it right there. If you take a look in there, I haven't damaged any of the growing tips. They're all still there. After I cut, got about a quarter pound of kale there. I'll go and remove any bad leaves. And within about one to two weeks, that kale will be reflushed right back out to where it was. All right, so very, very simple top cut method. So when you're doing lots of juicing and lots of salads, um, that's a simple way for you to get out there and harvest. And again, keeping harvesting down to about, you know, tower to table and one minute and 10 footsteps. Um, also, when you're, when you're out there cutting, you're, you're in keeping your tower garden maintained. You're, it's, it's, um, uh, uh, it keeps the pest away. We're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. Clean and bleach after each season. This is so important, guys. I strongly recommend a 5% bleach solution. So after growing season, um, you may not know it. You might have a root disease um, that, that can't transfer from another plant outdoors. So um, I just take one gallon of bleach for 20 gallons of water. I soak it for a couple hours, and that's it. That's all you have to do. So, um, But you want to be sure when you bleach after each season that you triple rinse every part. So and you also want to bleach every part. Um, anything that water comes in contact with. And this can really guarantee you a fresh start. We see this as a you know, common issue in really hot environments. I know a lot of you have friends down in, in Phoenix and Texas and Florida. And so when we go through our hot summers, um, it's very probable that we may have a root disease in there. So bleaching after each season is really helpful. And uh, finally, number six, partner with success. You know, my friend Janet Cook, um, she never was able to grow strawberries in a tower. And today she's growing a beautiful strawberry tower. So if you have a friend who's succeeding, become their buddy. Um, uh, you know, uh, take them out for coffee, invite them over for dinner, become, become friends with someone who's succeeding at gardening. And that's one of the best tips I can get you, you know, learn from success. I can't tell you the number of times I've been out to events where I've seen two people holding an iPhone side by side and one is succeeding and one might be struggling. And I, and I give that person who was struggling a growing tip. And, I, and then before I leave, I say, the two of you need to become friends because you live in the same city. <laughs> uh, my top five organic pest control tips, um, always keep your tower garden har harvested. We want the sun to be shining on the leaves. We want the breeze to be blowing through the leaves, okay? Um, this will keep a nice, strong, healthy tower. Bugs love to hang out in, in shady leaves that are kind of thin and weak. And so we want to keep our tower garden harvested. We do not want it overgrown. 
and I'm going to move past that one. Um, my uh, uh, some of my favorite organic sprays that I use, uh, soap and neem oil, is phenomenal for aphids. Now, if you use just soap and oil, you're going to be losing out on a natural chemical called azadirectrin from the neem tree, which is a natural insect growth regulator. So soap and neem oils works phenomenal on a lot of insects like aphids. Thuricide is a bacterium that is great for worms. And again, these are organic sprays used by organic gardeners and farmers. Natural pyrethrum from the chrysanthemum flower works great for thrips or beetles if you have those. Um, uh, I emailed Stephen this morning and uh, he, somewhere he's gonna post a list of my top five organic sprays that I use whenever I have to. I don't normally have to spray for pests because I follow um, some good growing practices, but if you need to, um, Stephen will be sharing with you where he is going to make that available. Most importantly, we wanna scout the undersides of the leaves and spray early. What do I mean by that? If you look at your cucumber plant or another vegetable crop and the aphids look like this on the bottom, um, there's hardly any organic spray or chemical spray for that matter that's gonna help you get your tower garden under control. Um, at this point, it's very difficult. So what we want to do is, I always recommend a magnifying glass. You can actually get these at the dollar store for a dollar. Um, you know, twice a week, when you're, whenever you're out there harvesting or you're around your tower, just, you know, look at your leaves. Look at the undersides of the leaves. Look at the new growth. And when you spot uh, uh, maybe one or two aphids on just a couple plants, we can do what we call spot spray. You spray the plant really good. The underside, the top. These organic sprays work well when they're wet, okay? They're, they're not a harsh chemical, so we want to just soak every part of that plant. So that lettuce there just had two aphids on it, and I can guarantee after one spray, we're probably dead. And in many cases, I'll follow up four days later with that same spray in the same area, and I pretty much, 100, like 99% of the time, take care of any pest um, uh, using uh, these techniques I just mentioned. Now, in July, we're, um, I'm also going to be doing a blog on um, natural organic pest control and this will also include some of these sprays i'm talking about so stay tuned to the tower garden blog and you will see this coming very soon in the month of july now um, some of the random things i always get asked is a kind of important part of my training uh, we have the our new microgreen planter this came out um, less than a year ago and so people are asking me you know what do i use the microgreens for um, uh, what can i grow in there well, microgreens, it's, a, it's really part of the healthy living revolution. Microgreens are small plants that range in size anywhere from one inch to three inches. They're also called baby greens, baby plants, edible flowers. And there, it's everything from, as you can see, they're a baby radish to um, a small leaf. And these are used to garnish salads and uh, various dishes and uh, um, uh, vegan dishes and and desserts, they add a lot of flavor and potency and nutrition to all kinds of foods out there. Um, uh, you basically, with a microgreen extension kit, you've got 32 plant sites. So it can go up on top of a five pot tower, which would turn it into seven, uh, you know, normal seven pot tower, but instead of eight plants, you have eight plant sites, excuse me, you have 32 plant sites, okay? Um, if you wanna do it on a five pot tall tower, you can do that, go three, normal pots up to five, whatever height you'd prefer, um, you can do, but um, it's a lot of fun. My wife, Jessica, and I have been doing this in our own backyard and indoors, and have, we're, we're, we've really fall in love, fallen in love with the microgreen tower. And um, I love it because this is our, our LED microgreen tower, and I love these microgreens because they add a lot of flavor, aroma, and punch to any salad or um, any of the, the dishes that we'd be cooking in our kitchen. But the number one tip I want to give you with the microgreens extension kit is that these are, I mean, once you transplant them and do your first harvest after about a week, you need to cut off of these every two to three days. These plants are very close together. And um, if you're not cutting off of them regularly, they're going to stretch and turn into a giant jungle. And some of you may, that may have already happened to you. So um, you absolutely, if you get a microgreens extension kit, you're gonna love it. You're gonna be getting a ton of food from it, but you've got it. I mean, I'm literally in there, once my plants are established, I'm cutting off of those plants almost every day. So keep them cut and pruned back and maintained. 
strawberries. Everyone loves strawberries. But I can tell you that strawberry plants, if you're growing more than one on a tower, they can be you know, one of the most difficult vegetable crops to grow. Um, they need a ton of light. The more light, the more fruit they're gonna produce. Um, the seeds take a tremendous amount of time to, to germinate. Um, if you live in the United States, Living Towers has some phenomenal uh, winter variety of strawberries. It means, in other words, uh, short day length strawberries. Um, strawberries have regional flowering types. So if you're up north and you grow strawberries in the summer, you need a long day flower. If you grow strawberries in the winter in Florida and Texas, you need a short day flowering. So you really have to know, um, talk to your local extension agent, uh, your local garden center, find out what varieties work for your area. You can cut your fertilizer strength in half. That'll prevent the strawberries from sending out so many runners and put more energy into fruiting. And uh, you can turn your watering cycles way down, even outdoors. Strawberries don't use the volume of water. In fact, this helps pre prevent crown rot and things like that. Now, in Canada, this is a big deal. Frost and freezing temperatures. Um, I strongly recommend a plastic submersible 200 watt heater. You can often get these at pet stores. They look like that. You can dial in the temperature for 69 degrees, uh, uh, put the heater in the sump. And you, I mean, I, in, in Apopka, Florida, uh, where my house is just outside of Orlando, um, I mean, we've gotten down to 17 degrees. And just by taking the tower garden timer and switching it from timer to on, in other words, letting it run continuously all night, and with warm water from that heater, uh, we haven't even had to cover it and have had great frost and freeze protection using this technique. You can also cover your tower with a large sleep sheet in combination with the heater or without the heater. Or we've got that wheel kit. If the tower garden's right outside your back door, you can just roll it right inside. So those are some. Um, the tower garden really extends a growing season. In a winter climate, we're starting two months earlier and growing two months longer in some cases with the tower garden. Um, many of you may have heard of the Bell Book and Candle, Manhattan's longest running, most successful roof table farm. And they're actually using these heaters and growing all the way through early December and then starting in uh, March. So they're only, their rooftop farm is only down for about uh, three months. And this 60 tower rooftop farm is eight, feeding an, uh, an 80 seat restaurant every night for dinner, all their vegetables, lettuces, and herbs. So. The heating system works very well. Now, another question I hear quite a bit is, how long does the tower garden take to pay for itself? So I think this is a contract that ATL Urban Farms out of Atlanta, Georgia and said, plant a cornucopia tower and you know just give us the local price in your local grocery store and, and compare it with what you've harvested. And they literally found in six months the tower garden paid for itself. So now again, this was a, um, a professional uh, grower who knew that he was doing. He wasn't a first time tower gardener. So a first time tower gardener uh, may take a little bit longer, but that can give you a good idea of the potentiality, right? Of what you can do on the tower garden. Now, if you're going on vacation and you don't have anybody to come over with a hose and fill your tower garden sump, um, uh, you can go to your local hardware store and get these little um, floats. You drill a hole in the side of your the top of your, your reservoir and put one of these floats in and connect it to your garden hose and it just automatically fills that sump when you're gone. And uh, in the US, um, uh, True Garden carries those. If you um, go to www.truegarden.com forward slash accessories, they have those kits already uh, available to you. And Living Towers is another place that also has, um, they don't have the floats, but they have some of the other tower garden accessories that are not on our website. So two good locations in the US to get some of those things. Now, next I'd like to talk about keeping your tower garden play year round. So up in Canada, obviously um, you guys have a winter in most places, a very healthy winter, right? <laughs> so um, we uh, uh, have found a lot of value. We've, um, I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity to try the new LED lights, but Stephen and I were talking last night and the LED lights in Canada have taken off like wildfire. People are loving them. And, you know, um, these are the LED lights in my own home. You know, here we have the tower garden, a transplant, seven days, 14 days, and 21 days. I mean, um, these uh, 
plants produce very quickly under the LED light. Um, we're harvesting from them regularly, really, really loving the new LED lights. Um, and and th these indoor lights are really meeting the needs, not just, they're meeting the needs of many people, not just people who have winter, but, um, you know, climates like, you know, Las Vegas and Phoenix, people who live in apartments and don't have a space to garden, condos, you know, uh, restaurant owners who are doing towers inside or in their kitchen, office buildings, um, inside RVs and boats. I think you saw the picture earlier of a tower on a boat and in schools. I mean, the tower gardens are transforming um, school education and lunch programs. Next, I'd like to talk about my um, uh, the top three benefits that we see growing indoors. Um, it keeps our fresh, you know, when a lot of people grow a garden outside in the summer, they get some healthy diet going. And um, when they can bring those gardens indoors, they keep that diet going. Their healthy habits, you know, they don't gain weight in the winter. They keep those good habits going by making beautiful salads and they do their juicing and smoothies, especially with the kids. You know, my kids have literally been grazing on my tower gardens um, since they could walk. And uh, so it's great to be able to do this indoors with them today. They're super strong and healthy. I call them my tower garden children. And many of you out there have children that have grown up with the tower garden produce as well. Super healthy kids. Um, indoor health events. People, you know, wintertime is when there's not a green thing outside. Wintertime is such a great uh, time to share about eating healthy and uh, bring new people into this healthy living revolution, teach them how to do juices and smoothies and that Shred 10 program that a lot of you are on. Really, really love that. So for indoor growing, all you need is your tower garden, your grow light kit, and some healthy seedlings. And I do want to mention that healthy seedlings are very important. If you take a look at that red box in your lower left-hand corner, that was someone who sprouted some seeds on the bottom of their tower garden under the LED lights. And those plants um, stretched out, they have a very thin stem, and there's a good chance that those plants are gonna struggle throughout their life. So it's really important, and this is such an important tip. You want to, you know, that picture on the right, that's what you want your seedling to look like. You don't want it to look stretched. You want it to look healthy and strong. So if you go online to Amazon or some other places, um, a lot of the seed companies have little lighted seed dome kits for your seedlings. I always recommend to start your seedlings over a good light for, you know, that's running 14 to 16, uh, uh, 14 to 18, 18 hours a day and get a strong seedling that looks like that picture in the lower right hand corner. And that's going to give you plants that look like the tower, uh, like the plants in the tower garden on the right hand side of the screen. The screen. So um, really try not to get stretched seedlings and that's, that's going to make a big difference in uh, how your plants grow. Now I have got, uh, there we go. So my top six door, uh, my top six indoor growing tips would be, you know, I, I run my lights 18 hours on. Uh, you can do a minimum of 14 hours if you like. Um, I like getting a bang for my buck. You can really reduce your watering cycle to 15 minutes on and 45 minutes off. If you can, locate your tower near the kitchen. Because again, if you, if you can see it, you will use it. Stick with lettuces, leafy greens, and herbs for the LED grow light. Start with the strong seedling. We talked about that. And good water supply. Don't use softened water. It contains salt. So if you have an RO, um, if you have softened water indoors and you have an RO system, um, that's a great thing to incorporate into your tower. But softened water can damage vegetable crops if that salt supply is turned up high. In a lot of cases, it is. So my top four horticultural tips growing indoors would be, again, you saw those pictures with my kids. Cut your towers. Keep your, your if those plants grow past the grow light, they're not going to do well. So keep them cut and prune back away from the grow lights like you see right there. Um, don't ever contaminate with outdoor plant material. Don't bring an outdoor tower indoors. Start with a new fresh towers indoors. That's how you bring in bugs, like you see right there. Um, clean and bleach after each season. We talked about that. Some of the best crops to grow. Um, given time, I'm just going to pull up this list and let you go back into the recording. But these are some of my top 10 lettuces and you know things like kale, chard, arugula, mizuna mustard greens, herbs like basil, chives, cilantro, celery, dill, mint, 
parsley, sage, oregano, thyme. With indoor growing, try to stay away from fruiting crops like tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, squash. We have people that do them, but they're more difficult and they're really for the tower garden pro. So again, stick with your lettuces, leafy greens, and herbs. Now, finally, I'd like to close with tools for supporting your tower garden and your tower garden customer. So in the, in the United States, we got towergarden.com. In Canada, we got towergarden.canada, CA. So we've got a YouTube channel that covers a wide range of things from setting up your tower to how to grow some of the various crops, okay? We've got a blog. Um, uh, you know, we have Logan Nicholson, myself, Carlos Madero, the Tower Garden team. We have all these blogs out there with a lot of great tips. If you haven't been to that blog section, I strongly recommend checking it out. I know there's so many moms out there that love getting this healthy food into school and getting tower gardens in the classroom. So we have a lot of new lessons and activities for schools. Um, um, under Growing Young Minds, we have lesson plans, you know, pre-K, you know, up to sixth grade, seventh grade. There's all kinds of all kinds of things happening under Growing Young Minds. So if you haven't been there, uh, check it out. We have a lot of things under Tower Talk as well from, you know, our e-newsletter to frequently asked questions to our Tower to Table cookbook to the growing guides and instruction, uh, instructional videos. So lots of good stuff in there. So again, my top three re uh, Tower Garden resources would be the towergarden.com or towergarden.canada forward slash grow. Um, the Tower Garden social media channels, okay? Um, if you haven't been there, check them out. We're always posting. Remember I mentioned earlier, my 60 seconds with Tower Tim. You'll find those uh, most frequently on the Facebook uh, social media channel. And um, most importantly, and this is something I really want to leave you with, partner with success. We talked about it earlier. Find a buddy, find a friend who's succeeding at tower gardening. And um, the most, you know, no matter what, no matter what you're doing or how you're gardening, I want you to keep it fun and simple. And I hope these tips will help you become a better gardener and a better tower gardener at home and in your own backyard. Thanks, you guys. Amazing, thanks, Tim. Um, not sure how to uh, add myself back in here. Um, so, but hopefully you can hear me okay. And we'll look at your smiling face as we, as we wrap up. Um, so I wanna thank you so much and such incredible information. Uh, I know for myself personally, I was making some amazing notes in terms of, uh, what we need to do a little differently perhaps. Uh, overfeeding is certainly something I can be incredibly guilty of doing. So, but I took away so much out of that and I'm sure everybody on the call did as well. So, and we've got the recording. So everyone just uh, give us a little bit of time um, and we'll make sure that we get this posted somewhere along with the resource that Tim mentioned around some pest control guidelines and some of his tips and tricks around any of those uh, pests that you may be experiencing, we'll get that and share that out as well. So you can pay attention to our social media platforms for all that information. Uh, but like I said, just give us a little bit of today to, to figure out uh, where all this will live and we'll promote that. Tim, thanks so much, your wealth of knowledge. I'd love to you know, just kind of have you here all the time as we're <laughs> you know, going out and harvesting and planting and doing all kinds of things. So um, really appreciate the time and I know everybody did as well. Thank you, Stephen, and uh, look forward to seeing you guys the next time I'm in Canada. Absolutely.